Hey everyone, I am trying something just a little bit different this week, so I hope you enjoy this more detailed and focused review of a single book. I'm Ray. Hey, welcome to my little bookish corner of the world. And today I am seeking justice and perhaps a little bit of revenge with three discarded wives who want to make sure their husbands get their just desserts in Olivia Goldsmith's The First Wives Club, which was released in 1992. This book has been on my bookcase for probably two years. It could easily have got lost, if not longer. And until we decided on the theme of book to film adaptations for this month's book club, I hadn't given it a second thought. People are more likely to be familiar with the amazing 1996 film starring legends Goldie Horn, Diane Keaton and Bette Midler than they are the book. And to be honest, so was I. Don't get mad, get everything. When their best friend commits suicide over her divorce, Elise, Brenda and Annie decide enough is enough. Each was crucial to her husband's career, but now that the men are successful, they've traded in their wives for newer, blonder models. Over lunch one day, they form the first wives club, but this is no support group. This is the SAS in Chanel. Painstakingly, inexorably, they plan the downfall of the men who've wrecked their lives and know that revenge has never tasted sweeter. Annie is separated from her husband, but she has hopes that she and Aaron are going to be able to work it out, if only for the sake of their children, Alex, Christopher and Sophie. Things have admittedly not been the same since Sophie came into their lives 16 years previously, born with Down syndrome and much more in need of support than her older brothers, and Annie has devoted her life to looking after their daughter, to the detriment at times of her marriage. Of course, she has no idea that Aaron has moved on, sure that things will be fine and dandy, especially when they see each other again at their son Alex's graduation from Harvard. Everything seems to be going well when she gets a call from her school friend Cynthia's ex-husband, Gil Griffin, who really comes across as a bit of a jerk. It turns out that Cynthia has killed herself, and far from the dramatic event that the film made it out to be, it's rather gruesome and blood-filled. But Gil doesn't really care. He's calling Annie to get her to arrange for people to attend the funeral. He's moved on, his new wife is younger, prettier, and doesn't have the traumatic connections that Cynthia had. But more on that later. Annie, being the accommodating woman she is, and she does come across as rather weak, calls around people that she knows remember Cynthia, including Elise Elliott, an ex-actress who made her name on the French screen, and Brenda Cushman, the ex-wife of a successful electronics seller, Morty. Brenda's whole identity is the fact that she's half Jewish, half Catholic, all Italian, incredibly bitter about her ex, and overweight. The day of the funeral arrives, and Elise, Brenda, and several others show up including a journalist called Larry who is trying to make his name and has a bit of an obsession with Elise. Of course, things don't ever go as well as you think they will. Brenda is loud, rather vulgar and very honest about Cynthia. She doesn't like the fact that the other woman wasn't keen to spend time with her. But there are things festering under the surface with all of these women, and most especially Cynthia, whose story is even more tragic once you get the full picture. Cynthia hid herself away because she was trying to escape. It wasn't all about her ex-husband leaving her, though the way he did it would be enough for most people. He was a violent bully who gaslit her and forced her into situations she both regretted and resented as the years went on. At one point, when he's talking about his second younger wife, he mentions that he's glad she didn't want children because it was her duty to be his and only his, paying attention to his needs and no one else's. There. That right there is enough to make you want to get revenge, especially after you've finished throwing up at the imagery that that gives you. After her son's graduation, Annie discovers that Aaron is getting married to the therapist that she introduced him to when they were trying to save their marriage. 
the therapist, in a show of bad practice which should get her struck off, attempts to gaslight Annie into believing that it's all her fault that their marriage failed, that she was repressed and not giving Aaron what he needed. Needless to say, when revenge plans begin, as Annie shares Cynthia's story with Elise and Brenda, two less likely friends you would never encounter, Annie is all in, though she is still unsure that she wants to get back at Aaron, which frustrates me to no end, if I'm honest. Elise has discovered that her husband Bill has been seeing someone else, but before he has the chance to ask for a divorce, she beats him to the punch. It seems that anger is all around and revenge is a dish best served cold. After after deciding their route of revenge, a rather complex plot involving the IRS, SEC and multiple other little vindictive twists, the game is on. But are they going to win when the men have all the power? The month of April has only just begun and with it has come the traditional (laughs) round of April showers that we are so well known for in the UK. But there have also been a few sunny and warmer days. In fact, we're enjoying one now. So that's a tiny bit of a bonus. With those days have come brighter moods and more reading optimism. Right now, I am reading book six of the month. But that doesn't mean I will continue in this way, and I don't envisage that I will be closing book 30 as the clock strikes midnight. This book fulfilled the promise I made to myself about reading something a little bit different. There are elements of humour in this story, but it's not all sweetness and light. I know that I am going to have to talk about the film just a little bit, if only because it is so well known and so iconic. Who doesn't remember the joyous you don't own me moment at the end of the film where the three leads are all wearing those beautiful but just a tad impractical white suits and singing as they celebrate their accomplishments. Surprisingly though this is a book that inspired such a successful film. The First Wives Club is actually rather difficult to obtain. It's not available on Kindle or Audible and certainly not as prime delivery which I think is a great shame. However, there are certain elements that make me think this is due to language and culture. I started this book absolutely sure I knew every single thing that was going to happen. But it's not quite the film, the sweetness and light and satisfactory success. There are moments that are dark and somewhat depressing and very real. Though I don't like spoilers and finding out what is going to happen, I do like to read and leave reviews but not until I have finished the book. Though I have been known to read a spoiler-laden review of a book I have no intention of reading, I am sure that some of you have done the same. Has anyone else read and enjoyed the Katrina Pasek Lumsden reviews of Fifty Shades of Grey? They are hilarious and frequent rereading. When it comes to reviews in general, though, I think that they are a really good reflection of how different everyone is when it comes to reading, because it's subjective. Anyway, let's get on to that review section. I always try and give a balanced view of the books I've read because I don't like coming down hard on one side or the other. But where I have done so, these one and five star reviews help to keep things in perspective, even if I don't agree with them. So if you're thinking of reading this book, don't let any of these reviews, including mine, sway you to change your way of thinking. Books and opinions of them are completely subjective. Stephanie gave the book one star and her review, which is pretty long, highlights many of the issues she had with the story. She said, I decided to read this book because it has a movie connection and I wanted to watch the movie again as I didn't really remember it. This has to be one of the most annoying books I have ever read. I wish I'd kept a tally of how many times I rolled my eyes or said aloud, I hate this book. This book is about a bunch of self-absorbed divorcees who come together after a friend of theirs, whom it seems they pretty much ignored or shunned, commits suicide. They seek revenge on their snobby husbands who seem to have left them for no other reason than for younger women, or in Annie Paradise's case because she couldn't have an orgasm, which I find as an outrageous reason to leave someone. The concept of this book was a great one, but the way it was written is straight up disgusting. The stereotypes throughout this book are sickening. I don't think I will ever forget until my dying day that Brenda Cushman is fat. How could I forget when every two pages, if she wasn't present, someone was talking about how fat she is? And if she was there, there was some type of reference that she was fat. 
always eating cupcakes and sweets, but only a size 18. My guess is if she was a middle-aged woman overeating, she would be close to like 300 or 400 pounds. But just a guess. Then she falls in love with a woman. But of course, the author makes the woman seem manly. So only fat women and those with manly features can be in love? What the heck? The conversations that the characters had were often predictable or shallow. The sex scenes were odd and often the offers to have sex were very strange. Also, I couldn't for the life of me figure out why these women were constantly showing up to social events that their ex-husbands were also at, and then with dates and people they were using to screw them over. The last annoying thing was all the name and product dropping. No, I am not accustomed to high society, but way to make me not relate by calling out the designer name items they wore or used. The $4,000 dresses, I get it, they're rich. So glad I am done with this book and I am going to permanently remove this trash from my bookshelf as I will never read it again, nor suggest any of my friends read it. It seems that the people who read and didn't enjoy this book had a lot in common. Issues with the use of certain words, which I will not repeat because they were pretty offensive. Racism, misogyny, sizeism, bigotry, homophobia, and general all-round nastiness. Yes, it is a product of its time, the early 90s. And when reading it with today's sensibilities, it will hit differently. However, that doesn't mean it sat well back then either more of that in my personal review because I have my own thoughts. The fact that many people voiced the same opinions makes it very clear that most of them expected something exactly like the film, which I did too, and they certainly did not get it. On Goodreads, the overall rating for the book is 3.89, and given the reactions that the one-star reviewers had, I am admittedly surprised that it actually rated this highly. The number of reviews for the First Wives Club actually surprised me as well because I didn't expect there to be anywhere near the 20,644 there ended up being on Goodreads. That's a lot. However, only 368 did more than rate the book, leaving a full review for me to have a read through and pick. 64% of those reviews were the more positive side with 13,527 feeling it deserved four or five stars, while 379 or 1% found it was a book they struggled to get through or didn't manage to finish it. Mariah gave it five stars, giving it a fair comparison to the film, but not judging it on that particular expectation. She said, When I first saw The First Wives Club sitting in a 25-cent bin at a used bookstore, I grabbed it immediately. I loved the movie the first time I saw it, and honestly, I had no idea the movie was even based on a book. I guess I didn't pay enough attention to the opening credits. I wasn't sure how I would like it. While I do usually enjoy the book over the movie adaptation, when I view the movie before reading the book, I tend to be more disappointed because it doesn't usually match up. The book, The First Wives Club, was definitely different from the movie, but once I got over that, I really enjoyed it. The relationships that run throughout the book are far more complex than what they became in the movie. Each woman has a deep and intimate story. The women, Annie, Brenda and Elise, are friends from the start, but are brought closer together by another friend's suicide. After learning about their friend's horrible marriage and divorce from her husband, they vow to come together to avenge her death. This also brings their own previous marriages and divorces into light. Each woman goes through her own transformation as they work towards getting back at their ex-husband's. The First Wives Club really has a lot that you would ask from any book. Comedy, drama, romance. I was hooked and couldn't wait to see what the friends came up with next. The author, Olivia Goldsmith, created real and interesting women for her book and grew them into even stronger independent women. If you loved the movie First Wives Club, the book is definitely worth a read. It's different, but it is just as enjoyable. This was actually Olivia Goldsmith's debut novel, and sadly, she passed away in 2004, not really ironically, post-plastic surgery. It appears that she lived as many of the wives in the first wives' clubs did, a bitter divorce behind her and ambition seeping from every pore. One thing that the reviews I have shared prove is that everyone has different views. So what I think is amazing or maybe merely average, someone else could feel very differently about. 
I guess this is why I believe you have to take every review you read or hear, including mine, with a pinch of salt. Anyway, now I have told you exactly what other people are thinking, let's get down to it. Here are my thoughts on The First Wives Club by Olivia Goldsmith. Completely spoiler-free and 100% honest, because that's the way I do it. Did I like the book? There is no way to avoid it. I'm going to have to talk about the film a little bit here, because without that, many probably wouldn't have heard about the book at all, though it appears many didn't know it actually was a book, including me. In the film, we see a much nicer side of every single character, and I know that I was rooting for them to get their revenge, which was far less brutal on screen. Yes, I feel that they may have removed a lot of what is in the book because they were making a comedy. And though there are small elements of humour in the novel, they are few and far between. The subtle digs that Elise and Brenda traded on screen were vindictive, cruel, and often so biting in the book that I found it incredible they could bear to share the same room, let alone breathe the same oxygen. Annie's character, who found strength as the novel went on, was nothing like the character Diane Keaton portrayed. In the book, I found her often to be more annoying than anything else. Did that mean I thought her husband had every reason to leave her? No, not at all. But I do think that sometimes she brought things on herself. She was far too accommodating, far too quiet and content to be in the background. Even after Aaron made it clear that he was never going back to her following sleeping with her while engaged to the therapist, she was still unsure about getting her revenge on him. In the film, the three women set up a foundation in Cynthia's name, and they are far closer friends who have been given a shared past. But in the book, the friendships are not exactly that solid. They haven't seen each other for years, and they never had a great bond, with many of their associations created because of their husbands. The revenge they seek is definitely far more vindictive and cruel in the book, making parts of it a far tougher read than I had expected. They aren't just going for their ex-husband's wallets for Cynthia's foundation. They want to destroy everything, their reputations, their lives, stripping them of everything, including their freedom. Overall, while it is a very well-written book, there are a lot of things that I have to gloss over and I am curious to see what my book club friends will think about the book when we meet up at the beginning of May because it's a tough one. What surprised me most about the book? (laughs) The language. I couldn't believe that a book that had such a collection of characters in it could be filled with so much abusive language. I know that a lot of it was used to shock us, but to hear the protagonists who we are supposed to sympathize with using the offensive references almost as much as the characters we were meant to detest, primarily Gil Griffin, who was an incredibly hateful character, was just astounding to me. Why would Goldsmith choose to portray these women who we were meant to like in such a manner? Were we meant to look at them with uncertainty, unsure as to how we were meant to support them in destroying the fathers of their children or men they had once professed to love? I get that this was about revenge, but at times I found it more than a little distasteful when they used terms that I cannot even bring myself to say. They were racist, anti-Semitic, homophobic, classist, sizist, misandrist, misogynist, and so much more besides. It was quite disturbing on many levels. If you're looking for something like this, or you loved this and want something else, then you might love these, and I'm saying might, (laughs) very loosely. As weird as it sounds... If I were looking for something that was steeped in some of the glamour of this book, then I would probably head towards the more 80s books, perhaps something by Jackie Collins or Jilly Cooper. Both of these authors veer towards books filled with wealthy and mean male protagonists and the women who love them. I am so perplexed as to why, though I still do have a little bit of a thing for Rupert Campbell Black. So while they won't be exactly like the First Wives Club, maybe think about Rivals, Wicked and Polo by Jilly Cooper and Lucky, Chances and The World is Full of Married Men by Jackie Collins. If you have any recommendations you think I should try, please let me know. Last week, I reviewed and had the chance to chat with F.T. Lukens about their book, Otherworldly. It was a great interview 
And well, at least I think so. And we talked about everything from post-it notes to their writing style and where their inspiration comes from for novels. If you haven't listened to it yet, it is a pretty long episode, admittedly, then seriously, please give it a try. It's full of joyful little tidbits and an exclusive about assigned Illumicrate sets in case you haven't already heard. This last week was a nice quiet one where work was concerned because we had Easter. I went in for half a week and managed to get a lot ticked off my list, as well as reading quite a few books, five in total. I also took advantage of the spring sale on the HarperCollins website and bought a nice and chunky selection of books, some fantasy and some romantic comedy, though to be honest, I doubt I will get to them until sometime next month when I have 10 days off work at the end of it to coincide with the bank holiday and live stream for The Cure, an event that is very close to my heart. I will be posting links to donate to this incredible cancer research cause in the info. I'm really happy to be involved again in my third year because this particular treatment has actually helped my mum. She found out this week that she is in remission, so that is something definitely worth celebrating. I am trying something new with this format, so please let me know how it's going because I know it's going to require more editing and that's something I need more practice with. But I hope that you've enjoyed a video version of my usual podcast episodes. Let me know if there are any books you'd love to hear me talk about. And please don't forget to like, comment and subscribe if you haven't done so already. Have you read The First Wives Club? Did you expect it to be exactly like the film? And if so, were you disappointed with the blatant differences? Let me know your views in the comments and I'll see you again next week.